children, it's Mrs Anderson here. I hope you're well. I'm going to be reading chapter three to you of Foghart. I hope you're enjoying it. Robert Townsend woke before the alarm sounded and lay listening in the dark. Something had disturbed his sleep. A noise outside. A distant but distinct crack. He glanced at the hands of the clock on the nightstand. 20 to 6. Crack, crack, crack. There it was again. What on earth could it be? Robert jumped out of bed and stepped across the cold boards to the window. Pulling back the curtain, he wiped condensation from the glass with the sleeve of his nightshirt and peered out. The village was empty. He scanned the nearby countryside, searching for the source of the sound. In the distance, behind a line of trees, a beam of light cut through the mist and came swooping across the fields. The arc lamp of an airship. A big one by the looks of it, and unusual for this time of the morning. Robert knew every flight schedule by heart. Whenever he wasn't working, he loved to visit the local air station, which served Brackenbridge and the surrounding area. He'd spot the Zeps coming in along the airways, watch the flyboys in their goggles and leather helmets carrying their toolboxes. The passengers dressed in smart travel clothes, queuing on the gangways. One day, he vowed, he'd go up there with them. If he could only overcome his fear of heights. This airship felt different. From its size and path, Robert felt it was not a scheduled flight. And when the mist separated, revealing the rest of the craft, he knew for sure he was right. He couldn't see its name or mark, but the ship had a look of a military model. Its silver reflection balloon seemed to suck in the moonlight. A harpoon gun stuck out from its hatch in its hot hull, and the front of its gondola was covered with metal spikes. Suddenly, the Zepp shut off its searchlight and changed course, climbing higher into the clouds. A popping sequence of musket flashes flared across the nearby field, and Robert watched three flickering lamps emerge from the woods and float down the hillside. They gathered in the valley and turned along the track towards the village. Something was going on and he had to know what it was. He grabbed his trousers from where they hung on the end of the bedstead jumped into them and snapped the braces over his nightshirt. As he struggled into his winter coat, he took one last look out of the window. Luckily he did, or he would have missed the fox. It trotted along the lane, throwing nervous glances over its shoulder. When it reached the green, it stopped and swayed, glancing about, and its eyes alighted on a line of shops under Robert's window. Robert had the strangest feeling it was reading the sign for its star's shop. But it couldn't be, could it? The fox no nodded to itself and limped onwards. It passed the church and the walled graveyard beside the village green, then stumbled into Pincher's Alley, a shabby track that ran behind the row of terraced air station workers' cottages. Robert waited for its shambling sh shape to emerge into the bare field at the Ellis Alley's far end, but it did not fit my peer. It must have hidden down the lane somewhere, in one of the cottage's back backyards. He decided to go and have a look for it. He drew on his socks and his shoes and took the candle from the bedside. Then he opened the door and crept along the hallway, treading softly so as not to wake his dar in the next room. At the base of the stairs, he drew back the rag curtain and crept into the shop. The familiar, familiar smell of beeswax furniture polish and the quiet ticking of the clock made him linger as he crossed the floor. Each clock's shape and sound was so ingrained in him, they felt as comforting as old friends. One night, on nights when he couldn't sleep, he often came down to watch the clocks and listen to their ticking. But not tonight. He put up a hand to silence the bell, opened the door and stepped into the street. The grey haze hung in the air along the pillowy 
silence of early morning. Far off, a, the barking dog echoed across the fields. He could have been the only human alive in the world. First, he made his way over to the place where the fox had stopped and started, stared up at the shop. There on the cold ground, among the patches of couch grass, he found a tiny cog. It resembled those he was used to seeing in the carriage clocks his dar let him repair. Only this one was bent out of shape and covered in warm engine oil, viscous as drying blood. Robert knew it could only mean one thing. The fox was clockwork. A mechanimal. He wiped the cog and his trousers and put it in his pocket, then set off across the village following the mech's route. He passed the church and was about to go off behind the air station's workers' cottages, down Pilcher's Alley, when he heard footsteps in the lane, lane behind him. He turned to see the large leash dog, an unusual breed, like an Alsatian, but bigger. As it came closer, he saw its skin was covered in rivets. A mech dog, then. It was followed by four men in long overcoats carrying steam rifles and lanterns like those he had from his window. He shuffled outside to let them pass, by, but, but they gathered around letting their mech dog sniff at him. When it got a good noseful of the oil, oily mark on his trousers, it let out a large growl. Shut it, one of the men told the mechanical. See anything go past? Another asked Robert. Anything unusual? added a third. The fourth man didn't say anything, merely glared. Robert decided not to answer their questions. He didn't like the look of them. A big fellow with ginger mutton chopped sideburns arrived carrying a steam rifle. His body looked lumpen, like a sack of rocks. He resembled a crusher, only without the policeman's helmet. Above his upturned collar, his cheeks were as red as bulging blood sausages. But what made Robert gulp was the pair of silver mirrors sewn into the raw sockets of the man's eyes and running up behind the brim of his hat. Who are you? the man demanded, peering down the vain blistered nose until Robert's face appeared reflected in his mirrored eyes. Robert's words dried in his throat. He took a brick deep breath. I live here, sir, he finally managed to wheeze. My colleagues asked if you'd seen anything unusual go past. The mutton chop man scratched his eye socket perilously close to his mirrored right eye. What kind of thing? Robert asked, his voice strangely whispered. A fox? The mutton chop man pressed his thick lips tightly together. It seemed as if he was about to reveal something more, but then he decided against it. Never mind. He jabbered a podgy figure at Robert. Get back to your house. I saw your fox run away. Robert blurted, pointing down the street that led to out of the town. You're certain? The mutton chop man's mirrors betrayed nothing. But it didn't seem convinced. He glanced down at the dog straining on its leash, pulling towards the alley. Oh yes, Robert answered. I watched it from my window. Which window? Over there. He waved at the row of shops at the other side of the village, keeping, a vague, keeping it vague in case the men were thinking of returning. The mutton chop man nodded. Thanks, lad. We'll be getting along, and you should too. The young boy, like you, shouldn't be out in the cold November mornings when there's danger about. He turned to go and the others and the dogs followed. Robert Dwing dawdled his way home, watching them, making sure they had took the path he suggested. They hurried through the village, but then they reached the last house on the left. They stopped, confused. The dog seemed to have lost his scent and wandered about aimlessly, trying to pick it up. For a moment it seemed they would come back, but then the animals pulled on towards onwards, and then they passed the last fence of the village, the black steam wagon appeared at the end of the woods, 
smoke puffing from the chimney stack. The mutton shop man pointed towards it, giving instructions, and the group split, and the other four men making off down the road with the dog while he was walking back into town. Robert decided to make himself scarce. He'd go looking for the fox later when the mutton shop fellow was gone. Besides, he had chores to do before opening time. Better get on. As he trudged back to the clockmaker's shop, the low morning sun shone against its frontage, burning off the last of the mist and making the clocks in the window gleam. Robert's family had owned Townsend's horologists for five generations. Its plain fa facade and classic sign did nothing to suggest the shrine of timepieces inside. Carriage clocks, pendulum clocks, cuckoo clocks and barometers covered every inch of wall and in the back stood the old grandfather clock with its gold pendulum which had once belonged to Robert's grandfather. Front and centre was a panel counter with a heavy silver till behind which Robert spent most of his days. When the sun shone, as it did in the morning, the glass-covered clocks threw patterns of light around the walls and every day, irrespective of weather, they filled the shop with their ticking, their different t timbers giving a place of percussive music all, uh, all of its own. Robert Starr, Thaddeus Townsend, moved in time to this beat while he worked. The short man was delicate features. His watery blue eyes were enlarged by the thick magnifying glasses he wore to adjust the timepieces. People came to Thaddeus with all kinds of odd repairs. Not only watches and clocks, but other devices too. Barometers, chronometers, chronometers, musical snuff box, sometimes even simple mechanicals. And Thaddeus would take these things apart and attempt to fix them. If a machine intrigued him, he often took on the work of cost. A skilled mechanist, mechanist and engraver and a dab hand at touching up miniatures, he enjoyed telling people how there would be much art in clockwork as there is in a beautiful sculpture or painting. His customers liked him because he cared. They came from all over the country to take advantage of his abilities and never paid what the label was worth. Dar had so much talent. Robert wished he'd shut up shot and move them somewhere where people would pay fairly for their work. Or he'd have dearly loved it if he could fix engines at the air station or restored old me mechanimals. But Thaddeus preferred the quiet life of Townsend's horologists. As things stood, Robert felt disdained to be destined to be a clockmaker's apprentice for, forever, which was a shame because he was simply no good at it. A bumbler, all thumbs and fingers, that was how he thought of himself. He was 13 now, and no matter how hard he worked, he could never manage the delicacy required for repairing the miniature mechanic mechanisms or dealing with the customers that come with it. It hadn't always been so. As a child he had been an enthusiastic pupil, nimble and quick, always wanting to learn things, but in recent years he found he'd grown clumsy, constantly misplacing tools or dropping important cogs down the cracks of the floorboards. This very morning, a mere hour after the excitement with the men and the fox had he had broken a valuable carriage clock, overwound it while he daydreamed about the mechanimal and the airship, and when he looked up he found the clock's teeth had sheared into the barrel mechanism. How many times do I have to tell you, Thaddeus asked, for what at Robert's count was the hundred and thirteenth time. It's seven and a half turns. One wind is seven and a half turns, his dark never usually raised his voice, but he did on this occasion. Now I'll have to strip down the barrel and overhaul it. Why, the new parts alone will cost me more than my fee. Robert said, I mumbled, I'm sorry. I must have miscounted. Thaddeus took off his glasses and pinched the bridge of his nose. 
Few things in life are as fragile as clockwork, Robert. Learn to be more careful. Robert sighed and Thaddeus squeezed his shoulder. Never mind, we'll make a clockmaker of you yet. But perhaps, perhaps you'd better work behind the counter today. For a while, until you get your confidence back. Robert did as he was told. But a while turned into two long hours. Then nearly three, and the whole time the fox and the airship and the mutton chop man with the mirrored eyeballs whirled around his mind like clockwork. Finally, after work, when he had a few spare minutes to himself, Robert put on his thick coat and cap and scarf and set out across the village. He passed the walled graveyard, the chapel and the terraced air station cottages on their cobbled street before arriving at Pinch's Alley once more. He cut down along the scrubby track without a second thought. The rear windows of the cottages were dark. Robert glanced along the line of the high brick back wall, looking for a place where he thought an injured fox might hide. Halfway up the lane, he noticed a gate ajar. Behind the gate was an old wooden shed whose roof poked up over the line of walls. In there would be just a spot for a frightened wall, a fox. Robert stepped through the gate and crossed the yard, squeezing past a pile of rusted farm equipment and approached the shed. The lock had been broken off recently, but the look of it, for the hasp hung loose by a couple of screws and the patch of wood above the doorknob was gnawed with tooth marks and freshly exposed. Robert opened the door and, taking care to cover his mouth against dust, crept inside. Oddments of wood leaned against the walls covered in peeling paint. Piles of newspapers lined the row of shelves and the floor was strewn with packing cases. An old table at the centre of the spaceship of the space, bottles clustered in glassy gangs, and above them cobwebs thick as knitting hung like hammocks in the dark aspect, apex, apex of the roof. Robert looked around for the fox and saw its threadbare tail sticking out from behind a stack of boxes. He stepped around an old steamer trunk and caught sight of the rest of the animal curled up on the corner of a faded water-stained mattress. It was scruffy looking, with glassy eyes and careworn fur that looked like it was molting in patches. A pouch and the mechanimal's uniquely winding key were hung around its neck's neck. Robert crept towards it, but it didn't move a twitch. It was frozen, still, unwound. And that's the end of chapter three. I do hope you're enjoying it and I'll see you soon. Take care, children.